was, when I was a young boy, probably, let me see, I, I go back and I don't remember a lot of what happened in Puerto Rico. I was born in Puerto Rico in 1966 in Cuomo, Ponce, Cuomo, somewhere out there. And for very, very vaguely, the farm. I remember the. Of course, I went. I went to the farm in in Puerto Rico when I was uh, with my dad in twenty thirteen. I believe my father took me to Puerto Rico with him. I was very young. We. We're talking about fear. We're talking about what happens to a child, what happens to an adult because of domestic violence, because of confusion and the environment. I don't fault my mother. I don't fault my dad. Unfortunately, they had faulty training. And that's what they had to work with. My mom would tell me stories recently. She just turned, what, 76, 77, my mom. My mom is another human being that most of her sisters and brothers, they're all gone. Most of them. Jeez. My mom comes from a pretty large number of brothers and sisters are all gone. My dad's in the same position. He's got a couple of sisters, some half sisters. And of course he's staying with me here in Stockton. I take care of him. Oh, I don't take care of him. I had to put him in a, in a medical facility. Uh, so he's there and I visit with him every other day. I don't deserve to be alive. I don't deserve to be alive. And I'll tell you, when I, when I was a child and my mom, so I remember the the the, uh, the chicken coops and stuff like that in Puerto Rico. We had, my, my grandfather was apparently had a little bit of wealth. It was given to him or he was hired by some very wealthy people and they put all of these things on the land. Actually, they gave us, they gave, my grandfather and there was quite a bit of land in the homes so my father's side they, they were kind of he was a little well to do but you know, they put in a lot of work and my dad was pulled out of school very early I, I think fourth grade maybe not fourth grade maybe less than that I'm not sure because he doesn't know how to write of course, now he's got, he's advanced in age and he's got a little bit of dementia going on. I remember, I remember many, many times my dad would, he would drink alcohol and, and he would, he was on these prescription pills I remember very early on and he would create these environments my mom was really quiet she didn't and she was scared is what it was and I remember my brother, we, my brother got an older brother, Fernando, and a younger sister, Nancy. They're still alive. In fact, they're with my mom. My dad eventually divorced my mom. He he eventually left her. Um, I left into the, into the military when I was 18. But eventually my dad, he just got away from all of us. So my dad came into my life just a few years ago, honestly, probably about 10, 15 years ago, he came back into my life. I remember my dad, he would drink, he would get very violent with my mom. And he would, I mean, he would, 
would do things. He would, he would hit my mom. I, he would punch my mom. He would smack her. Uh, there was times where he would throw things. And, uh, you know, I used to see this. I, I We would hide. Uh, we would just kind of hide, you know. We would go. I remember there was many times where, because uh, we were children, you know, we were scared. I mean, I, I imagine I was scared, right? A little child and doesn't have a, a secure home and, and I, 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 I go back and that's the only reason why I can honestly say that a lot of the decisions that I've made over my teenage years and even into adolescence and even up to recently, a couple of years ago, I really began to transform my way of thinking. All of that was based, my thinking process was based from all the way where I would see my dad cutting his wrists with with a razor or whatever. He would pull out a knife and, you know, the, these are the things that he would drink and he would get into fights with people, the neighbors and, you know, the police, the police would come to the house. It's like nobody really wanted to come around. My dad's family were the ones. They, I don't know if they knew what was going on. I think they did, but they were like afraid of my father. It's like everybody was afraid of my father. My mom was always in and out of the hospitals. Back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, it's like they didn't even know who my mom was. And yet she was always in and out of the hospital, in and out, stitches, bruises, and just imagine a person getting beat all the time. My mom, I, you know, my mom graduated from a college a few years ago and she ended up building a little career in teaching after surviving because I left at 18 and they were still together. Even, even after my father stabbed my mother five times in front of our apartment in Hartford on Bedford Street. I remember the name of the, the street. I remember, I'll have to go into detail about what happened there, man. That was a, that was one freaking weird night. I know it was for me. And to see this and to witness, you know, for many years we were being in this and we, my dad would create this environment. And I talk a lot about environment today in my teachings because that's what we need to do to get ourselves out of, we need to create environments because environments are being created for us. But now as a child, Think about this. As a child, you're, you know, you're innocent. Well, you're not innocent. You're still a little sinner. But you, you come into this world, you don't have, your subconscious, your mind doesn't know, really doesn't know it a whole lot. But what you know inside yourself as a creature, as a human creature, but a baby can't express. A little boy or a little girl really can't express themselves like a teenager or an adult. So they see life from a whole entirely different perspective. They're in a different realm, a child. And when a child is exposed to violence like that, it, it literally crushes, it crushes a child. And the child doesn't know and it begins to grow and and some children act out, you know, some children rebel and they get, they, they become violent and, uh, and some become recluse, you know, they just hide away, they don't want to be around other people. I was kind of a mixture of that because I would hide, I would escape, I would look for escapes and of course I was always getting, 
very, very early on, eventually, you know, because of the pain and and the suffering that I was going through, I would just look for escapes. And I lived in the projects in the East Coast. We lived in, in Hartford, Connecticut. We, uh, I believe my mom said we lived in Chicago, either in Chicago or, or Illinois for just a, a very short span of time. We came from Puerto Rico. Uh, again, I was born in 66 in Cuomo little hospital there in Ponce didn't have a chance to see it but I went back I did go back to Puerto Rico and my life is transformed I, I tell you my life is thank you for listening to this testimony and you know what my friend I hope that you benefit from what I'm sharing and I'm not done we're going to continue for a little bit here in fact, I might do this video in two parts because it's going to be a long video. You know, I remember my dad would put us in a vehicle and we would drive to New York City. My dad, it, from Hartford to New York City was about maybe, it could be two and a half hours, really, if you pushed it, you know, the, the metal, <laughs> the pedal to the metal. Of course, you got to be careful. There's a lot of bad roads out there. Really, really bad, bad roads. Um, my dad would get us up in the middle of the night. I'm serious. In the middle of the night. And my mom, you know, my poor mom. And and we would follow him because he was like the... He was like a... He was kind of militant. My dad was very clean and kind of organized, but he had this really dark side about him. He had a very dark side about him. He would leave and, and he'd beat my mom and he'd leave and come back a couple hours later or he'd come back a day or two later. And he had mistresses. Obviously, my dad was... A, he had a lot of women. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of women, but he's had women in his life. So even early on. And in fact, we owned a restaurant in Hartford, Connecticut one time. I remember we used to, I used to go there when I was a little boy and we I would eat. My uncle, Andy, he, he's passed away. And my dad and my mom, they opened up a restaurant. My dad totaled it. He... Oh boy, I'll have to tell you about that one. Nearly killed my mom in the place. And got in a fight with my uncle and made some really, really poor decisions and eventually sold the restaurant. He ran it into the ground, my dad did. So uh, it existed for maybe some, some months, some months, a few months. We would go to these trips in, in New York we jump in the car, two 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 and a half hour drive. And with my dad, it would turn into like six hours, seven hours. And here we are, three, four year, five year olds, six year olds, seven year olds. My, my brother's a little bit older than me, a couple of years. My sister's younger. And and my mom is older than my dad, but she's just a little little woman. And we, we don't know, you know, driving from Hartford to New York, he... He had family in, in Brooklyn, in Queens. So we would travel. I would spend summers in New York. I would, I would spend summers with a cousin of mine uh, for at least three or four years. I would spend summers. Boy, that's another ordeal there. My, some of these summers that I spent in New York City in Brooklyn. My dad would get lost. He would become frustrated. And you can understand people get lost and they don't know how to control their emotions. They don't have a, a an effective mindset. My dad was not a learned man. He was a, he was more of a brute. And he'd take it out on you in, in, in a flip of a dime. If he, you know, if he found himself in a situation with us, with him. And there was many times where we would just find ourselves lost and we'd be in the car and I, I tell you, it, it brings a little bit of a tear tear to me thinking about. And then I grew up in high school. I, I Going through high school, I, I got pushed to go through finished school with 
my mom and I didn't have any courage. I didn't have any, I didn't have anything. Now, when you listen to my story and you realize why I can tell you that I didn't have, I was numb during, completely numb. I was just existing. That's it. I was just like a shell. Just a shell. And I didn't know why. I didn't know why. 48 years later, 47 years later, I come to find out what happened. That's what I'm sharing in my books and in my seminars and webinars, whatever. Wherever I can share my story to help you on the other side. Hopefully you'll become a partner. By the way, my books really, if you want to understand what I'm sharing, I would encourage you to get my books. They're not expensive. Purchase, you'll support me. You'll support my our work. We're reaching out to, to many people around the globe. Many people are sending us comments and people are being impacted in a positive way. Uh, man, I'm just wondering if I should just keep going for a little bit and just break this video up into sections because, you know, it, it got worse. It would get worse. I, when I tell you I, I don't know how I'm alive today, it's a real, it's a real reality. My dad would take volumes and he would drink beer and get violent in the house and get violent outside. One time he got, one time he, him and my uncle got, uh, well, they went to a bar there in Willie Manic downtown and my dad was a fairly big man, 235 pounds. He used to like to work out. He was a brute. And and uh, he found, you know, I, I, I started working out at around 13, 12, 13, 14 years of age. I started lifting weights and he basically took over and he just saw that. And he, he became very strong and muscular. People became more afraid of him. My dad, this is really strange how all of this was and he had family members that would come over the home and they were all they were all damaged most of them were damaged and i remember the the abuse i remember a lot of things that went on that was not healthy for anybody my dad would would just you know, take these, and then he would have these epileptic seizures. I remember these seizures he would get. He'd be on the ground shaking, and my mom would run and try to help him. And maybe somebody was there visiting my aunt or some something. You know, typically when he was drinking and mixing the the Valium and the the lithium pills that he used to take, lithium and Valium with the alcohol. He used to like to drink. You know. My dad was a drinker and I, I picked that up from him. I became a very bad drinker myself, especially during my military, those eight years. I got really bad with alcohol. He would have these epileptic seizures and, and I would see him. I, 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 he'd grab a spoon and grab his tongue pull his tongue, he's going to swallow his tongue. I remember listening to that. And this would go on. Well, I, I think I left an open loop here. My dad was at a bar with my uncle at one time there. My uncle went into the bathroom and, and my dad was sitting at the bar. I don't think that was a place that they frequented. If they did... I don't know exactly what happened, but my, I guess my uncle, he's a lot smaller than my dad, very, a lot smaller. He went into the bathroom and he came out of the bathroom. He saw my father was on the floor at the bar stool on the floor laying, he was out cold in a puddle of blood. He got cracked in the head with some either Somebody said, my, my uncle said that it was a piece of pipe or something. So he got hit, his head 
got cut pretty bad. He was knocked out and blood. I remember my dad coming home with a bandage all the way around his head. It was crazy times. It was crazy days. The Ku, the Ku Klux Klan. The, there was a, a lot of stuff happening in Woolly Manic during that period. And, you know, we had... I remember the guy next door, you know, he was wild. I mean, one time the guy came out of his house. I don't know what happened. He came out of his house with a bat. I don't know what I was doing. But see, I, I, I would see these things. and be, I lived in fear. I lived in fear all the time. A lot of people didn't know that because they, they didn't see a lot of the stuff that we went on in the home. But, you know, after a while you would hear, you know, things. You could, this guy, I remember, I, I won't mention his name, but he was somebody that I hung out with. I hung out with three, I hung out with quite a few friends. And unfortunately, most of them have passed away very early on. This is another reason why I tell you, I, I just don't, why am I here? I'm here to share these stories. I'm here to help the next generation. I'm here to empower people to get away from gambling as quick as possible. As quick as possible. And I'm talking about like now, now. Where was I talking about? These, my dad and all of these things that my friends, Andy, he died at 19. We used to ride motorcycles. I drove a, three, a Honda, 1978, 450, and I've had a couple other motorcycles. Nearly decapitated myself a couple times. So Antonio, who hung out with me, and Gilbert, He's gone, and Anthony's gone. Laurie is gone. She used to be my girlfriend back when I was 16, 17. She's gone from what I understand. And, and yet I'm here. You know, they're, they're, they're gone. I, I say that I'm not supposed to be here. I, I should say, you know what? I'm here by divine appointment. It must be because I know for a fact that what I've been through, when now when I look back and I, when I look back, you know, my spirit was crushed as a young man. I remember making a lot of decisions as when I was in my 20s and 30s, but I was making decisions and, and they were really horrible uh, people would take advantage of me. I, I would get in relationships with women. And, uh, you know, we would take advantage of each other. But I was pretty, I was a pretty good guy because I was scared, you know. So I really didn't like to stir the, the water, you know. And women would come to me and most of the time because I, I was a shy guy. I was afraid. That's the guy that I was and. You know, I ended up in many places around the world. When I was in the military, oh boy, that's another story. And speaking about my dad, you know, he, my uncle found him in, in that pool of blood. And, you know, my dad, he threatened us many, many times. I, I remember many, many times. This is, I can remember all of this. And can you imagine as a child what I was going through? I was very numb because I started drinking and doing drugs very early on. Because people out in the streets where we were, in the, in the neighborhoods there, in the projects and stuff, we had access to just about anything. And people, adults didn't care. They didn't care if we were 12 or 7 years or 8 years. They didn't care. And I just grew up with all of that. Anyways, barely made it through the military. I did. I got out with an honorable discharge in 93. And, you know, I went on to begin 
reading the Bible. I never read books. Never, never. I started reading the Bible and I read the first one of my first books was Anthony Robbins. Actually, I read many other religious books prior to Anthony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. And that's what started me on this journey of self-discovery and prayer, asking God to guide my steps and really show me who, who I am and who I'm supposed to become in these, in the, especially in these, these difficult, challenging and dark times that we're in. I want to be, I am a light. That's why I invite you to our community because there's light in our community. Well, I left home. My sister, my brother were there. They've struggled over the years. They're still close to my mom back in Connecticut. They're back there. They're still in Connecticut. My mom survived the tragic accident of being stabbed and losing all her blood in front of the apartment there about 6.30, 7.30, one evening, you know, back in Harford. I thought I lost my mom. I didn't, I was numb. I didn't know what I was feeling. I just know that my mom was gone in the hospital for a long time. And I remember seeing my dad in a police car when I, this big black man walked me out of the facility where I ran out of the house when my dad came through the back door and everybody started yelling, there he is, there he is. It was a really strange scene. Anyways, I ran out. My brother, he, from what I understand, he chased my brother, but he couldn't catch my brother. And he got a hold of my mom right there in front of the apartments, and he stabbed her five times right there in front of a white van, very close to a white a, a, a white van that happened to belong to, to some painting company. I didn't see that. I'm glad it was dark late at night. I was walking back after it all. The ambulance was gone with my mom. I was walking back with this black man holding me. I ran out of the house and I ran to the, the there was a store or disco kind of parlor place there around the corner. I remember we used to smell crabs and lobster in the mornings from people, uh, you know, the discoers. They would go in there and dance, loud music, and they'd eat crabs and you could smell it throughout the whole neighborhood every couple of, Weekends, on weekends especially. Well, I ran in there. And I remember yelling at the man, don't kill, my daddy's trying to kill my mom. But I see this guy pull a gun and I say, don't kill my dad, don't kill my dad. I remember telling this guy, he grabbed a gun from this coat, like a meat, like a, like a coat that meat cutters wear. White coat, overcoat type thing. And I saw him grab a gun. Oh boy, you know, so I've, I've seen people get shot. One guy, I remember one guy there on Main Street. I could have become a, an accomplice with this guy. It's a friend of mine. One night we were traveling. And actually I was coming home, driving my little Toyota from, I might have been coming from my girlfriend's house, Lori. She, she's passed away. It was about 16, maybe 17. I was driving. I, I actually had my license back then. I was driving very early on. Even though I was just kind of screwed up, I had a license. And of course, the tests were a lot easier back then in those days. So you could easily pass, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the te driving tests were easy. And, uh, oh, let me see. Where am I? Got a little bit of distraction on the phone. Let me get back to that. Get back to that Connecticut. But that's what what I the guy that was with me in the vehicle. One time I was it was driving and and uh, his name was Tony. I seen Tony walking down Main Street. It was kind of late at night. And I was heading that way, so I, you know it's what we do: pick up each other and stuff like that. I got right next to the curb and he opened the door of my Toyota and he jumped in. He goes, let's go, let's go, man. Take me home, take me home. And I looked at his leg 
and he was bleeding. He had blood all over his leg, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this guy's going to get blood in my car. But I wasn't thinking about, you know, what was going on. He didn't tell me really what went on. He just said he got into a fight. Well, just up the street, got into a fight, and uh, he's killed a guy in the bar, Tony, right? And he, he's in my car. I'm driving this guy who just killed somebody in a bar and got shot. He got shot either once or twice in the back of his leg because his leg was swollen up and it was bleeding really bad. I could see that, even though it was dark. And all I could do is just drive my car and I left him in the projects where he lived. I just took him down there. Can you imagine if they would have came after me, if they would have seen him? Well, there was family feud between the, those fa that family and Willie Manick. Another brother got killed from the, the uh, sip, sip, you know, family ri rivalry and stuff. It would get really bad between Puerto Rican people back then in those days. So my friend, you know, when it comes to faith and believing something that I highly esteem today, I'm, I'm very high in confidence and, and in faith. I'm, I'm so grateful. I did not have the thoughts. I did not have the capacity. I did not have the confidence. I did not have the intelligence. I did not have the wisdom. I did not have the stamina. I did not have the energy. I did not have the belief that I have today. I had to go through those times. I had to go. And, and you know, we. this is, this is life. We, we can become better or bitter. And for some reason, God has allowed me to become better. Because believe me, I could be very bitter. I've had cars stolen. I've had money, lots of money taken from me. I've been ripped off horribly in different... And because I, I was given... I've been abandoned by friends of mine. In the military, you're supposed to go out and... I remember many times I was abandoned, left in places where I'm thinking, man, <laughs> Lord, thank you. You know, you brought me here to share these stories, to share with people and write my books. And Well, my dad eventually, even after that tragic accident that we left Willy Mantic, you know, after all the beatings and my mom, 32 stitches in her finger and it went on until that climax of the stabbing. And, and then we, um, my dad didn't go to prison. Uh, he, I don't know what he did. He pled insanity, I think. So, and he, of course, his family had a little bit of cash. They had to be able to get in attorneys and stuff like that. And he didn't go. I think he took off to Puerto Rico or something. Mom and I, and we waited for her to recuperate. Uncle Andy, they, we moved us. We got us away from that apartment. We never wanted to go back. We went back to another place. We started fresh. Well, my dad ended up finding us and coming back into the picture. My mom was afraid. She was humbled. She, we were children. What are we going to do? We didn't understand all. We were numb. My dad comes back. and Eventually, I ended up leaving. Um, when my mom and dad were still together, they were living in an apartment. My mom has a home today, her own house. She's a master's degree in education. She retired. She did well for herself. She's a miracle lady. Stabbed, kicked, pulled by the hair when she was pregnant in the, in the yard there, in the, the farm. She would tell me, my mom told me some really, really bad stuff that, happened I didn't know I had no clue but I can tell you my dad one time he took me to Puerto Rico I'm gonna be finishing here and you know what if I post this as a as a as a podcast if I get enough feedback I'll I'll take you on some more journeys I'll take you on some stories and and we can maybe travel the world when I was in the military I'll share some of my darkest things that I've, I, I can go back and look at this but you know my dad eventually left my mom and I left 
before they separated. So I, I, I left. Um, my dad has dementia. He's, I'm the only contact that he has. He came into my life a couple years ago. He was really broken, broken down man. Totally broken. I was shocked when I seen him because I hadn't seen my dad for quite some time. In fact, one time in the conversation on the phone, he actually told me that he didn't want nothing to do with me. So I just basically lived my life and then I guess a woman, a girlfriend of his called me and said, hey, your dad's really ill. You're the only son, you have to help. And Well, he's been in my life ever since, but it's a different relationship that I have now. He's funny, he's, he's broken, this guy, you know, a guy that would stab my mom and I don't have any animosity toward him. I, I, have, I don't have, I've forgiven him. He was trained horribly by his parents. Well, maybe not completely horribly, but they pulled him out of school. His dad, his dad was a brute. Pulled him out of school very early on. He was working this big, big farm there, Puerto Rico. I remember the chicken, we had chicken coops. They would, they brought these huge things in, on the land and they gave it all to my grandfather and he worked, he worked to the bone and my, my dad was, was a worker too. I don't think the other brothers were around all the time. So my dad was the one that took most of the beatings. The other brothers found ways to get away from everybody. They found ways to, you know, there's brothers and sisters. Of course, there was no women really working from what I know. But I remember going into those chicken coops as a little boy. I remember I used to eat the seed. There was a seed that they would bring and, and stuff. And we had pigs. We had pigs and I think we had a horse or two. A bunch of chickens and stuff. And uh, my grandmother... My father's mom was killed by a bull in that we had in the yard. She literally rammed her and killed her. She ended up getting gangrene. So she died from a bull accident. And uh, all of these things. And, you know, family members today were kind of spread out. A lot of my family, we don't even people that I try my best to reach out here and there, but that's just the way it is. I keep building my community with you. If you're on the other side and you want to be a partner, you're welcome to join me. I'm only going forward as fast as I can because I know that time is not going to be with us forever. And whatever we have to do, I believe that we should be doing it now. You know, you and I don't have the luxury, especially if we're a little bit older, we don't have the luxury of of wasting time. All right, my friend, I would encourage you to leave a comment, share this video, this podcast, thumbs up, and I will see you at the top, at the very top on my on my next one, my friend. Remember, your good life is going to come out of a good series of good, constant, positive reminders. Santos Rolon Jr., you got a friend in me. Your coach, Stockton, California.